delighted to be here. My name is Leah Namias. Um, my day job is I'm a community leadership officer, which means I'm on the grant making team for the Central Indiana Community Foundation. But prior to joining CICF, I have had a career in education and in the public humanities, which is why I know Jason and I'm really excited to be here. Um, I had Professor Bodner as an undergraduate um, at IU, um, went on to teach high school US history for a few years, and then I was very interested in questions of like, where do we encounter history outside of a classroom? What does it mean that we kind of have this history with us. I was very interested in the questions around public memory. So those are questions that took me to graduate school. I did a master's in public humanities. Um, and then I have worked in a couple of different places. I worked at the American Social History Project at the City University of New York. Um, then I was at the New York Council for the Humanities um, as a running adult reading discussion programs. A lot of what we're gonna be talking about today comes out of that work. Um, and then I was the director of programs here back in Indianapolis, which is why I'm from Indiana. Um, Indiana Humanities uh, before leaving. I was there for about six and plus years. And the pandem pandemic kind of broke me and I needed a break. <laughs> so I changed things. Um, during that time, I have done a lot of work around how thinking about how do we get people who don't otherwise have a lot in common to come together and have a meaningful conversation. And as we're gonna talk about, I think text-centered conversation is a method for doing that. As I will show in a slide in a minute, I think it is the gold standard for kind of a certain kind of public humanities work. Um, and I think it, it brings out the best of what the humanities can do. Um, during my time at the New York Council for the Humanities, I was also involved in a collaboration with the Great Books Foundation to create a national reading discussion program for veterans called Talking Service. And it was really designed for veterans who are kind of returning home, right? Kind of this idea around returning home and the, the transitions from service to, to, to retirement or post active duty, whatever you want to think of that as. And so I've had a little experience specifically in the space of conversations with veterans. I am not a veteran um, um, and I don't pretend to know all of the complexity, but I have an incredible respect for it and hopefully can share some of the things I've learned both in general around how we facilitate conversations in the public humanities, um, but also specifically maybe some things to think about. So my hope is that I didn't overload this slide deck, but I would appreciate everyone's help to keep me on time and to move me along. Um, and then also hopefully we've left some time at the end to kind of talk through questions, fears, hopes and dreams, you know, kind of that sort of space. Um, so if we can go to the next question, what I'm gonna ask you guys to do is you guys are gonna be group one and you're gonna be group two. In group one, I want you to talk together and be prepared to share out in a three or four minutes what are the qualities of a good conversation? And I'm not talking about a good conversation in a classroom. I'm talking about the kind of conversation you actually want to participate in your life as a person in the world, right? So what are the qualities of a good conversation? And group two, I want you to think about a good conversation that had some sort of facilitator, formal, informal. You know, sometimes people just kind of have natural leadership qualities in a conversation. Sometimes you might have been in a formal program. But I want you to think of a good conversation you've been a part of so it's not a hypothetical, but something you've been a part of. What did the facilitator do and how did he or she encourage discussion? So I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes to, to kind of generate some ideas and we'll share out. Okay. I think you got a couple Jumping in arbitrarily. This is not enough time. Um, I would love to hear from group one. What did you guys say were some of the elements of a good conversation? Keeping people engaged. And Can everybody hear? Keeping people engaged? Okay. Keeping people engaged, everyone being involved in the conversation. Okay. And then showing interest in people. Who's showing interest and how do you know? Just in general, like when you're talking, people seem to be showing that they're interested in the conversation you're having. And then making connections beyond personal beliefs, because you know, if you're in a group discussion, you'll have different political backgrounds, religious backgrounds, social, economic backgrounds. So making those connections, even though you have fundamental different beliefs, Personally. So finding kind of points of connection is what I hear you saying, yep. as opposed to like, oh, I read this and it made me think of my political belief, or I read this and it made me think of my right. social class or whatever. Okay, gotcha. And then active listening and interested listening, people that are actively listening when they're having these conversations. And then curiosity, extending the conversation. If you have questions, continue asking more questions. Um, yeah. I thought I heard you guys also saying towards the end, I didn't want to leave or I wanted it to keep going. And I mean, I can relate to that, right? Like a really good conversation leaves you wanting more. And you're like, ah, oh, 
especially if it's like a bell rings and you're done. You're like, ah, oh, I hate that I'm done here. Okay, hold on to those feelings. Thank you for that list. Is there anything you guys would add that, you know, or clarify? Appreciate that, Cliff, thank you. It's always hard to be in the note taker role. It's usually not something you've chosen. Okay, what about you guys? What are things that you've seen facilitators do that produce good conversations? Can you say a little bit well, more about so, that? Like, sometimes people, when they're in the discussion, they'll go off on tangents that are relevant. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of just, you know, whatever. But then they'll go way off topic. It has nothing to do. Like, you'll start off talking about the war. And then, oh, I took my dog down the road the mm -hmm. other day. And then the, and I saw a flag. Can I ask you to be specific about what a facilitator does in a moment like that that you think works? And anybody can answer this. But I want us to, like, really start naming practices if we can. I mean, literally this body gesture, thank you, and this, right? Like, and I just want to name that that's a thing that can like acknowledge that somebody's doing something, but you're not making eye contact is actually one of the tricks, right? Is where you give eye contact as a facilitator is giving permission of people to speak. So I just want to kind of name that. So you did it instinctively, right? But I cut you off. What was something else you were going to say? Yeah, I know what you had to say matters, but this other person wants to say something or let's get back to the topic at hand, which is, so don't like dismiss them because you know they're going off, mm -hmm. but say, hey, you know, I, I like what you're saying, but let's hear something. Reminding people kind of what the purpose is, right? Like, hey, let's bring it back. I agree. Were you going to add something? No, I'm kidding. Okay. Are there other things that you guys think facilitators do to encourage discussion? or make good conversation? Well, I will say you just did it just now, which is, and we didn't talk about it specifically, but you're scanning the room constantly, and so you're watching for people's reactions, or someone taught they were going to add something, or, or whatever, so you can come back and bring it. Yeah, nonverbal communication is like really key, especially when you've got a big talker, but even when you've got quiet folks, right, is learning how to read and scan and draw people in. What are some other things? I think uh, a facilitator can like make I use the point making like be a devil's advocate. So if a conversation is just like strictly everyone's agreeing, it's not necessarily the best. No, it's boring as hell, right? Like, like yeah. I want to walk away from a conversation having learned something or like changed my view on something. Uh, specifically, like in high school, my government class, I remember the professor was, or the teacher was very good at like giving opposing points of view because your high school you don't really know politically where you align, but everyone thinks that they do, and so they just want to argue their little. Yeah. Like, I mean, so I actually would say two things in there. One is introducing new perspectives. I want to come back to the actual phrase of devil's advocate. And two is, um, oh gosh, oh, I lost my second thought. So um, what do we think of the phrase of someone saying, you know, I want to play devil's advocate or I'm going to play devil's advocate? Do we like that? Do we not like that? What do we think? It's just common. You're right. It doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother you. Okay. It doesn't bother you at all. Okay. I will say, oh, what, what, sorry. Yeah, I always find it kind of smarmy, personally. Like, it's like, well, I'm smarter than everybody else in the room, so I'm going to play devil's advocate. And so, I, you're right. Like, everybody knows what it means, but I do think it's like one of those things like that can come across a little smarmy or know it all. And so, I think it's absolutely essential that facilitators introduce new perspectives into a conversation or try to. We're going to talk about this doubt consensus. If consensus is happening in the group, doubt that that's actually fully felt. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, to think about how you introduce a new point of view and how might we avoid the phrase like, well, let me play devil's advocate because that is obnoxious personally. All right, anything else that you guys want to add or that you guys want to add? Anything that the facilitators didn't do? Like good facilitators don't do X. Is there anything? Yeah? They don't talk a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, correct. Um, that's a good one. We're going to talk a lot about that. All right, if we can go to the next slide. So we're going to talk today about tech-centered conversations and kind of facilitation practices around tech-centered conversations. I think that this is the best method that I really know of to get a group of strangers or people who otherwise don't have anything that in common to kind of um, come together and have a meaningful conversation in a short amount of time, right? Like the kinds of meaningful conversations that you might have with someone after you've known them for years or many, many sessions, I think are possible 
you know, in 90 minutes around tech center conversations. Um, there are other kinds of facilitation practices, and a lot of those come out of kind of organizing or consensus building spaces. Um, and there are practices that are rooted more in kind of teaching pedagogy, right? Different kinds of, but we're, we're gonna be talking about a very specific kind of tech-centered conversation for public humanities programming. When I say text, that can actually be a lot of things. It can be a written text, a poem, an essay, a speech, a novel. Um, but it could be other kinds of text. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about the object at the center of the conversation, a photograph, a piece of art, a piece of media. I think a lot of these techniques are common across different sorts of text-based conversations, although I think that art and media have, and film present their own kinds of challenges and opportunities. And if we want to, if you guys are planning to facilitate with any of those kinds of texts, we can talk about that at the end. So one, some of the reasons why I think text-based, we can go to the next slide. And I'll share all these slides out with everybody later. Um, text focus the participants and the conversation. I personally have been in a lot of conversations where it's like, let's just get everybody in the room together and start talking. What happens in those kinds of spaces? Talks. Nobody talks, that might happen. Anything else that can happen in those spaces? No yeah, you don't, it doesn't feel very productive. Anything else that kind of happens in those kind of spaces that, are, that you don't like? They go off the rails and you know, it's really hard to pull it back, right? I mean, one of the things that I sometimes happen is people just start sharing their personal experience, right? And it's really hard. I mean, sometimes the only thing you can really say is like, that was your personal experience. I heard that, but you can't, it's hard to probe with a stranger, their personal experience. And so you, everybody just kind of nods and you move on to the next thing and it just kind of becomes like, I don't know. It, it, there's spaces for that, right? But I, I don't always know if that's like the most productive way to use everybody's times, and it's really hard to move that group in any particular direction. Texts help you kind of get focused, like here's kind of what we're here to talk about today. If something kind of goes out of the orbit of the conversation, it's easier to pull it back. Like, hey, appreciate that. Like, um, where do you find support for that idea in the text, right? Or like, hey, can we turn back to the text now, right? So that it just helps you kind of structure and keep everybody kind of in orbit together. So we'll go to the next slide. I will say that I think short texts, like one of the things I like about them, I don't know if this will be present in this program, but short texts can be read aloud together, right? You can do the work at the beginning, right? We read a poem, we read an essay, or maybe a couple of paragraphs out of an essay, and that gets everybody on the same page before discussion, because we've all been in spaces where nobody showed up, and, or half the people did the homework and half the people didn't, right? So I'll just mind, like, short text, actually, you can do it all in 90 minutes, right? Um, next slide. Texts are neutral. So what I mean by that, texts, of course, are not neutral, right? They have points of view and perspective, but the person who wrote it is not in the room. They might be dead, right? And when there is tension in a group of talking about a text or when there's discomfort in the group, you can kind of, I think skilled facilitators can direct that energy to the text and away from the participants, right? And so that it's like we're frustrated here with the text or if things get heated or uncomfortable, there's a way of kind of sitting and saying, let's go back to the text, right? And it just kind of gives you the space to come back to in moments of discomfort. Um, so I also am like, you can, you can call the guy who wrote the text an asshole and say you disagree with him in a way that I think is not what you want if that person's sitting in the room with you, right? So I, I just think texts kind of have this neutral quality um, that is helpful in discussion. <coughs> Next slide. And texts become a shared experience. It's the one thing you can guarantee that everybody in the room has in common, is they all read the text. And I would encourage you when you're planning facilitation to plan with that in mind. Don't assume necessarily that everybody else has things in common or has the same ideas about something. Cliff, you talked about this idea. People come in with all their different lived experience, their values, right? But the one thing you can kind of guarantee is that text is a shared experience. And, and I will think about, this is one of those things, I'll talk about this at the end with veterans groups, right? The idea of working together to make sense of something is a bonding experience and it creates a, a group cohesion that I think can be a really good and productive thing. Um, one thing to keep in mind is um, really to ask questions that are really grounded in the text 
because as soon as you kind of ask questions that require a lot of secondary knowledge or specialized knowledge, or that, that expertise creates hierarchies in the room, right? Whereas if you're just focusing on the text, like everybody comes to it and you're valuing the different perspectives people come in, but it kind of gets rid of some of those hierarchies. As soon as you ask a question about the larger context, the person who does their PhD in that topic will know lots. And the person who's like, I walked off the street <laughs> And all of, like that creates a hierarchy, and I think you want to be really mindful of that. We'll talk more about questions here in a moment. So there are many approaches to facilitation. In organizing spaces, for instance, the purpose of facilitation may be to get people in the room to come together around a shared goal or to a shared objective, right? A shared action plan, right? But I think what I'm going to be talking about today is where really the goal is to get people to consider ideas, right? You're not trying to wrap up, I mean, you're not trying to, I, I don't think, trying to get everybody to think the same way by the end of the conversation. So you're leaving space for the fact that there will be, you know, different ways of thinking about this, but maybe you've, I think I actually heard this group talking about this. A good conversation kind of raises new ideas, right? And you get a chance to consider new ideas. And I just want to think, like really hold that space that this is not, about building towards a consensus. It is okay if people disagree. It is important to model healthy disagreement, right? Um, and to make space for healthy disagreement. Um, and that, <laughs> especially as the facilitator, you're not there necessarily to change anybody's minds. One of the things about working with adults compared to students, even more, maybe students today are cooler than they were when I was around a student, but like they have, established values and beliefs and opinions. And this is not indoctrination camp. We're not trying to move them in any particular direction. Um, it's okay, and this is like, <laughs> you know you have failed or you're in a certain kind of conversation if someone feels the need to kind of do the Jerry Springer final thought at the end. Because that means you've tried to move everybody to like, well, let me tell you what this all meant. <laughs> don't ever do that. That's a rule for facilitation. I don't remember if I put it up at the end, but don't, ugh. I'm like, it makes my skin crawl. All right. Um, I will say, I will make the case that facilitating a discussion about a text is not the same as teaching a text. Quick show of hands in the room. How many of you have actually like ever taught a text? Like you've just been the teacher in a room and you've had to teach a text. Okay, right. Just kind of curious to see what we got in the room. Does anyone have any thoughts of what might be the difference between facilitating a text conversation in a public community session versus teaching? Just some thoughts about what maybe those differences might be. Well, teaching a text, you're basically telling them what it, the text means, what they're supposed to get out of it, and stuff like that. Facilitating a discussion is letting people interpret what they think about the text mm -hmm. and what they think it means. I see lots of nods. We, we feel good about that. I mean, I think that's a really important thing, right? Any, anything else we want to add? Yeah. The common experience of teaching may be that, right? But, but okay, I see but, what you're saying, yeah. But um, if you're teaching a text, you do have certain goals at the end. Whereas right. Whereas facilitating a discussion is frequently a lot more open-ended and it's up to the group to come up with what the goal is. Yeah. Anything else that we would? I think when you're, when you're using a text in teaching, you select it, well, I guess I select text because in the context of what we're discussing, I that text symbolizes something that we're more broadly discussing. So, okay. Well, it might not be intentionally to get someone to a certain viewpoint. It does, you know, symbolize something broader that you're. Okay. That you're, yeah. That that lesson of the day or the week or whatever. Uh -huh. Anything else? These are all really good answers. So I'm going to repeat a couple of things. Is like I think a lot of times, and this may be rephrasing some things that we've heard. Is like. A lot of times with teaching, maybe not, maybe not good teaching, but a lot of times with teaching, the, you're the person who's teaching decides what's important about the text, right? And in facilitation, this kind of facilitation, the group is going to be part of that decision, right? They're the ones pointing out, this is the thing I want to talk about, and you're kind of following the group there, and you're facilitating their conversation about that idea, but there's a, the, the power hierarchy in that kind of room is very different, right? And I think that's what you're getting at with saying, Good teaching should be like that all the time, hopefully, right? But yeah. Um, 
I also think a lot of times when you teach, you're really compelled to give a lot of secondary or contextual information um, or to cover the most important points, right? These are the three things that have ever been said or written. So this is why this text is really important in the history of X, right? And I think with facilitation, that's not necessarily the, the, the work that's happening, right? Because it's much more about getting people to explore the ideas that are in that text than to know all the things about that text. And it may mean that you don't talk about all the aspects of the text because you're really interested in a particular theme or a particular idea. And that's okay. And for those of you who are teachers, like letting go of the pressure to be like, oh my God, they don't know this essential thing that all the scholars say is the most important thing about this text, that is very freeing, right? Because you're really gonna be focusing in on a few key themes. Um, yeah, so when you're facilitating, you're choosing the aspects of the text that are most important for exploring the larger theme or ideas of the conversation. We can go to the next slide. All right, so the next section of my presentation is really gonna be about like the choices that we make as facilitators to actually produce the kind of conversations we wanna have and really thinking intentionally about all of those choices. I think that there are a lot of small but very important choices that can kind of set you up for success or failure. So, um, you know, I think always at the beginning is like, what do I want to have happen because of this conversation or these conversations, right? Really kind of knowing what you, and you, this group may be spending time doing that together, but I'm sure you're going to do that yourself. Or if you're co-facilitating, doing that work with your co-facilitator, my God, I hope you're on the same page, kind of. Um, and then what choices do we create um, or that will create or preclude our desired outcomes? So this is just kind of what the next section is going to be about. If we can go to the next slide. So. I'm gonna go through a lot of information really fast about preparing to facilitate and asking questions. And I will say a lot of this is also in the handbook that you guys have. I helped co-create that handbook when I was at the New York, New York Council for the Humanities. So before the conversation, sorry, read the text. I know this seems really obvious, but like, don't go in cold. And my former colleague Erica would say, read the text three times. And then we're, you can just go one, two, three, and we'll get them all up here and talk about them. Sorry, this text is small. First path, just to get a sense of the text as a whole, right? What is this thing? What's in it, right? Second pass, what are those snag points? What are the things that actually catch your eye again as you go back through it? It may be a phrase, it may be an image, it may be an idea or even a, like a particular sentence. Pay attention to what caught your attention because those are probably good points of conversation. And the third pass, is really you're gonna be thinking about themes, right? What are the big ideas that would be interesting to talk about, not just to point out? We wanna talk about themes, but like a theme is like, what is justice, right? What is democracy? What is, I don't even know how to phrase this. Usually I think of phrase as a theme as a question, or it's like a one word, right? Like the meaning of friendship, or the meaning of service, or things like that. We can talk more about themes, but like, trying to draw out what are the larger themes of a text is that final piece. And that we do this in the humanities, we're kind of, this is humanities work, right? But I think when you're reading the text, give yourself permission to spend some time with it before you facilitate, if you've got time. It's hard when you're doing a full novel, it's a little easier with an essay or a poem. Okay, the second step is just make a plan. We can talk more about this, but like have a plan going in. I'm gonna say something now, but I'm gonna say it 55 more times. If your first question to a group is, did you like this text, you have failed. What happens when you ask right off the bat, well, did you like it? What happens in the room? We've all been part of these conversations. Oh, yeah, totally. yeah. oh they say that? Okay, so you're in a really nice room of people that are all like, yeah, I loved it, I loved it. They say yes. Mm -hmm. What else can happen in those spaces? No, I hated it. No, I hated it. <laughs> Uh, yes. I don't know. Then what happens? Oh, all right. There's that guy too. All right. Okay. But usually you get yes or no. And then what happens to the rest of the conversation? People just defend their point of view, right? And we're going to talk about this. You're asking people to make an evaluative judgment right off the bat, right? To decide whether they liked or didn't like, if they agreed or didn't agree. And then you spend the rest of the time in that conversation just defending that point of view. Very few people will say, well, I changed my mind about this after 90 minutes of saying yes, when I started off saying yes, I like it. I will also say the least interesting question you can ask about a text is whether somebody liked it. There are just a million other things that are more interesting to talk about than whether somebody liked it. I will say if you have to know at the end of a conversation, ask then. And like, you know, if nine times out of 10 people are like, well, I didn't start out liking this text, but 
but now I really did kind of like it after we spent some time talking about it. But just have a plan. Don't just go in there shooting from the hip um, with like your, you know, well, what did you all think about it and did you like it? Those are, just don't ask those questions, especially to start, maybe somewhere later. Next question is then you're gonna write questions and we'll, we can put one, two, three, four up. I'm gonna hit a lot of this over and over again. Um, but first question, your first question sets the tone for the rest of the conversation. We can go back, sorry. Sets the tone for the rest of the conversation. So really that first question is like, what are we all here to talk about, right? The last question, what do you want people to leave the room thinking about? What idea do you want them to keep thinking about as they go home and talk with their friends or they're driving home or they're going on a run or whatever, right? And then, um, so, and then we're gonna talk about rules, kind of some rules for asking questions. When you're writing questions, Focus on what's important to talk about, the themes in the conversation, right? Write questions around those themes, and then think a lot about how the text can bring you back together if you get kind of out in the weeds. So when I'm thinking about making a plan, I think a lot about my first question, I think a lot about my last question, and then I figure out the middle part somewhere in between, right? But I really think about where do I wanna start people and where do I wanna leave people. I'll put this up here later, but like, Let's say you're having a 90 minute conversation about a text. You may have a list of 12 or 15 questions. I actually don't think you need that many. Eight to 10 is probably fine. And if you only ask four or five, that actually means you've done a great job because one of the rules we talked about is good facilitators don't talk a lot, right? And so that actually means the group is spending a lot of time talking. And in like really phenomenal conversations, the group asks its own questions, right? And like you've created a space where they're asking each other questions um, so again, thinking a lot about the first and the last questions, and to use a stupid metaphor in a group of talking about veterans, like avoid the forced march, right? Everybody knows what it's like when you've got 15 questions, you gotta get through all of them. That probably means you're teaching the text rather than you're facilitating a conversation about the text. Um, okay, sorry for going fast. Next slide. Okay, so themes. Themes are concepts or ideas that we understand because we got multiple points of view, right? We understand themes, we go deeper and we understand them better because we're having conversation, because we've spent time thinking about them, because we've debated them, because we've meditated on them, right? We understand themes through dialogue and through exposure to other points of view. Um, so that's why they're great humanities things, that's why they're great texts, you know, we wanna find those themes. A topic, is like someone can come up and give a lecture on a topic, right? I'm somewhat doing a version of that now, right? I'm not facilitating conversation. I'm teaching you guys something, right? But like a topic is something you read a book about it, you heard a lecture about it, you listened to a podcast about it, and now you know about it. There's been a, a, a unidirectional transfer of knowledge, right? Whereas a theme, it, it opens up the more perspectives you consider and the more time you spend with it. So that's when we're thinking about themes, we're thinking about things that reward spending time and discussion or debate. So themes can be expressed with words that describe ideas, friendships, faith, courage, right? Or through questions like, what is a leader? What does it mean to be free? Like those are thematic questions. So I'm gonna give you some rules for facilitation. Some of these came out when we were talking at the beginning. First, listen. There are lots of ways. I heard the phrase is active listening, right? leaning forward, making eye contact, paying attention. Some people, they jot down notes, right? Because they're, I have a memory of a goldfish, right? So that helps. Um, don't answer your own questions, even if no one else is. And also, good, I, you know, A, if you do that, everybody just waits for you to do it, right? They just know that you're gonna do it. It's also you, who, who cares what you think? Like, like, just get out of the way of the conversation, right? But if you ask a question and nobody answers it, like, that's okay. You can just say, it sounds like that's not really an interesting question for the group, so I'm gonna move on. Just do that and move on, right? It, it's okay if, like, nobody wants to talk about it. Um, be comfortable with silence. We'll talk about this over and over again. If you're facilitating, silence always sounds longer to you than it does to people in the room. If you can model being comfortable with silence, everybody will get comfortable with silence. There are ways to give people permission that it's going to be silent. Like, I'm gonna give everybody a couple of minutes to think about that. And then just give people a couple of minutes. If you say, I'm gonna give you a minute, give people a minute, like get your phone out. 
Because again, you'll be like, oh my God, that was a minute, it was 15 seconds, right? Silence does not mean, we'll talk about this, that something isn't working. It often means that people are gathering their thoughts because you've asked a good question. You're asking people to do some really deep intellectual work. And for some folks, silence means you're giving them time to gather their courage, right? That most people in their day-to-day -day lives do not come together with strangers and talk about a text, right? And that is like a hard and unusual thing to do. So we just want to give people space to kind of gather their thoughts. We we'll talk about some other techniques to give people that time. So let them talk. I think a really healthy conversation is 15% of the time is facilitators talking, 85% of the time is the group. I think that's really hard if you're new to facilitation and it may be more 60-40, right? But just keep, keep kind of heading in that horizon. Um, so really spending time listening. Um, my friend Erica that I did a lot of the facilitation work with in New York, she would say, I just have a conversation with my husband or my friend before I teach or facilitate a text so that I can get all my thoughts out and I have nothing left to say when it's time for the group, right? Just get it out, then you said your piece, and then you can be ready to facilitate, right? So that's a, like a potential strategy for you. Um, I personally, this is the thing I struggle with the most because I get so excited and I want to talk about everything and I have to shut up. So I work on that really hard. <laughs> Next, um, be curious. This actually also came up in your guys' group, so really good job. <coughs> Only ask questions that you want to know the answers to, right? Now, when we teach, we ask questions all the time that we don't like because we know we need to ask the question to make sure everybody understood, da 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 da. Only ask questions that you're really curious about. Those are probably going to be questions, as we'll talk about, that are interpretive questions, like questions that are open to interpretation. Like, I really kind of want to understand different ways of thinking about this line or this action that the character did, right? Um, Invite input from everyone, right? So that's that constant work of like, think, you know, what do you all think about that? Anything else to say about that? Anyone disagree with that, right? You're always kind of inviting in additional perspectives. And I will say, follow up on ideas. Oh, sorry, I didn't, sorry, Jason, I'm terrible at this. Okay, follow up on ideas. This is not a Q&A, right? Choose, so, so if people like express an idea, like you can ask people to go deeper, can you say more about that? Like, I'm not sure I understand. Um, can you think of an example of that? Can you find support for that in the text, depending on what's happening? Um, you know, uh, and if it, if it means you go deeper in one direction, because that's where the group's pulling you, that's okay, right? Like, kind of allow the conversation. So this is that second rule. Choose questions that make sense for the conversation that's actually happening. I think we've also all been part of conversations where the facilitator is just kind of pulling it in one direction and it feels like the group really wants to talk about something else. And so I think good facilitators, this is also that thing where it's like, okay, maybe you've got 15 questions, but you might only ask six or seven of them and three of them might be things that you thought of in the room because you're trying to respond to what's happening in the discussion. Next one. Another rule is to doubt, right? So this is you as a facilitator, doubt consensus. If everybody in the room seems like they agree, you should doubt that. Like, I just don't think with a group of strangers, like everything Cliff said, everybody's got different life experiences, values, and perspectives. It is very unlikely that in a group of like 10 adults that there is perfect consent. If not, oh my God, you need new friends. But like, I, so, but be the rational minority. And I will say this sometimes, we live in a stupid age right now. And I think a lot of people are like, well, I've got to introduce the extreme, like freshman dorm room version of like, a, well, what about this scenario that will never happen in the real world? You can be the rational minority, right? Like, so I think that, um, you know, and there's ways to do this in a facility. If everybody's kind of agreeing, just saying like, well, is there, are we sure we all agree on that? Is there anything that anybody feels uncomfortable with about this kind of consensus that we may have achieved? That's one way to talk about it. You could also, um, you know, well, we'll this is where you can introduce the devil's advocate, but maybe your mileage may vary on using that phrase, right? Um, is, there, is there a perspective that's not in the room that you think if somebody, were, somebody else were here, they would introduce, right? Get people to kind of think outside themselves a little bit to introduce new perspective. Doubt generalizations or stereotypes, like all veterans do X, all people from Indiana do this, all Republicans think this way. Doubt those things and push people, right? Like it just, just and again, you can express it in a non-confrontational way. Like, is that really true? Right? Or like, you know, just 
And I will say, particularly when stereotypes come up, I think that that is an appropriate moment to kind of step in and just say, hey, I want to name that that's kind of a stereotype, you know, and, and, and that, you know, people are more complex than that, right? So thinking about how to interrupt that leaping towards stereotypes is really helpful. And be the voice of doubt. Model respectful disagreement, right? And you can do that in a non-confrontational way, which is like, you know, Jason, I hear what you're saying. I'm not sure I agree, right? And here's maybe a reason why. Um, or, and, and my friend Erica, who I'm going to talk a lot about here, she would always say, facilitation is a performance. It's okay to express a point of view that you maybe don't hold because it produces, it moves the conversation in a particular direction, right? Um, you can keep how you feel about something pretty close to the chest and you can kind of bring out a different perspective. I think this is actually something, Jason, you do really well. <laughs> so, but yeah, I think that you can kind of be the voice of doubt and model respectful disagreement. Another rule for facilitation is to build. So we've talked about this already. Ask questions that make sense for the conversation that's already happening in the room. Ask follow-up questions that connect or clarify. Okay, Cliff said this, Jennifer said this. What do these two ideas have in common? Or are these, are these the same idea or is there any differences between them, right? Like those are ways to connect and clarify. And ideally it feels like a conversation among friends, not just a back and forth, right? Where you're just, okay, the facilitator got their list of questions. We went through all the questions and now the conversation's over, right? But that you're kind of building a conversation together. It's collaborative, like authority, power, however you want to think about it, is shared among the participants in the discussion. Good questions for this kind of conversation are grounded in text. We'll look at some examples of that. They are simply stated, right? It is clear what the person is asking. There's probably one clause in it, right? There's not like a a long, long wind up. This, academics are terrible at this. This is, this is like, academics do many things wonderfully, but they are not good at asking short, concise, clear questions. Um, and that might mean you need to write things out and like workshop them sometimes. Um, good conversations open up the conversation. They can be answered in more than one way. They are not forced to answer questions, yes or no questions. They manage and direct the flow of conversation, which is like, you know, Somebody said this, I want us to kind of return to this part of the text, or that made me think of this, right? So you're kind of bringing it back to your themes. And they give the conversation purpose. So that's why questions like, well, what did you all think? That does, that's not grounded in text. That doesn't give the conversation direction or purpose. It, it just kind of is loose and sloppy, and it just, it'll feel like that in the conversation. Um, a lot of times grounded in text might mean that you're just like going to a piece of the text and you're reading it out loud together and you're spending some time making sense of what it means and then also what the implications of it are. And we're gonna talk about that. So we're gonna talk about types of questions. This is adapted from great books, uh, facilitation. So they talk about three types of questions and I have a fourth up here. The first is factual questions, right? What did the author say or what did the character do or what happened, right? These are the kind of questions that you ask at the beginning, usually, to just kind of establish some shared points, right? We're all kind of on the same page about what happened. Um, we'll talk about this. If you ask too many of these, it starts to feel like a quiz. It starts to feel like teaching, right? But you, and you can use these strategically, right? It's like if this group's kind of starting to get off into la-la land, bring it back to the text. Well, hey, can we go back to this point of the text and actually look at it? Um, interpretive questions. These are questions that can genuinely be answered in more than one way. Now, I know with historical sources that can be hard because oftentimes there is kind of a scholarly consensus about what something means. But just remember, your group probably doesn't know that scholarly consensus. And there really is space for kind of like unpacking and trying to interpret what something means. So those might be questions of like, what's the author's intent? What is the character's motivation right here, right? Why did things unfold the way that they did? Um, what could explain two contradictory statements or actions, right? Those are kind of interpretive questions about a text. True interpretive questions can be answered in more than one way. Some answers are more convincing than others, right? But they can be answered in more than one way. Um, and I will say that interpretive questions, when you're doing those reads, those snag points, like why did they do this? Or why does he say this? Or I don't understand what this means. That's probably an indication that that is a place to build some interpretive questions because it's caught you and you're kind of thinking around it. Evaluative questions are questions that ask, you know, that ask us to evaluate. This is, I mean, if you ever do kind of like pedagogy of learning, this is the highest order thinking, right? These are questions about values. These are questions about beliefs. These are questions about implications, right? Now, they will ask you to connect what you've read 
to the real world or to your lived experience, right? Um, these are intellectually the most complex kinds of questions to answer, right? Because you are drawing upon or maybe forming or reforming values, beliefs. Adults love this. This is where they go automatically. They want to go, when somebody says, I liked it, I didn't like it, they are actually answering an, eva an implied evaluative question, right? And one of the things as a facilitator you want to do is slow that instinct down. Wait to get there, right? Spend time establishing some shared facts and some interpretive kind of species before you get to these evaluative questions, right? I think if we start here, it starts in the heaviest. You haven't warmed people up. You haven't, you actually aren't sure that everybody's kind of on the same page about a few key interpretive moments in the text. So, um, these are the juicy questions, but they are the hardest, so build towards them. And then the last one is just like follow, types of follow-up questions, right? So questions that help participants consider what others are saying while also refining their own ideas, questions that introduce new perspectives, questions that link comments on ideas. I just went through that very, very quickly, but what I'm gonna do really quick is, is like, we're gonna look through some questions and you guys tell me what kind of question you think it is, okay? Are we ready? We've got the major types here. All right, ready for the next one. According to the Declaration of Independence, who endows humans with certain inalienable rights? What kind of question is that? Factual. Factual, right? It's like, let's go in the text and find out who said, does anyone know who's a smarty? Thomas Jefferson. Good guess, but no. The creator, right? Oh, that's some weird shit. Okay, all right, let's go to the next one. Yeah, okay, all right. No, no, you're right, you're right, right. What is Dewey getting at when he says, we act as if our democracy were something that perpetuated itself automatically? What kind of question is that? Interpretive. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Correct, this is an interpretive question. What is he getting at? Esther Morris says she likes Wyoming because everyone, this is from a children's book, because everyone is important. How is that true in this group or in our community? I can tell you it's not true in Wyoming. <laughs> No? <laughs> Maybe it was in 1869 when women got the right to vote. Okay, all right, no. Uh, what kind of question is this? Interpretive? One thought about interpretive? Th this is kind of an evaluative question because it's really trying to kind of take it out. It's, it's a, a question of implication, right? It's kind of taking it outside of the text and kind of starting to say, how is that true here? Is it true? That's actually a sign that's an evaluative question. Like, do we think that's true or not? That's an evaluative question because you're getting at belief and values and things like that. Why does Brecht say that the man on the corner of 26th Street and Broadway won't change the world? I'd say it could be factual because maybe there's a quote in there about what he said. That's a good guess. Any other potential interpretations? Yeah, I would say that you're right. If you had the full text, you would actually realize this is a really good point and a bad example for teaching with, but that this is an interpretive question. And usually why questions are always, why did it do, why did he do that? Why did he say that? That's, an inter that's a sign that it's probably an interpretive question, but you're right, you don't know the full text um, to know whether there's an answer actually given by the text. All right, next one. Jason brings up an interesting point. What do you all think? Follow-up. That's a follow-up question, all right. Next one. What are two things William James says struck him after the 1906 San Francisco earthquake? Factual. Factual, right? You can go find it in the text. He says those two things. And to go back on that, that's the kind of text question you ask when you're trying to get the group to focus in and you're kind of building towards a larger theme, right? Like, let's just get all together on the same part of the text. All right, next question. Do you agree with Dewey that persuasion and discussion are essential to democracy? And if so, what role do they play? Evaluative, right? Like, do you agree? Questions of values and implications, right? What do you all think of what we read? That is an evaluative question. It's a crappy evaluative question, but it is an evaluative question. You're asking people kind of like, what do you, do you agree? What do you think? I, th I think bad facilitation often starts with this, right? That's a sign of an unprepared facilitator to me, someone who hasn't done a lot of planning. All right. Did you like it? Evaluative. evaluative. This is the worst question. This is the number one don't ever ask it question. Again, it's also just the least interesting thing you can say about a text is whether you liked it or not. Okay, so a few more thoughts on questions. Sorry, we can go. Sorry, Jason, I'm really making it hard for you to film this. Okay. Um, what do I have up here? 
and I'm not watching time. Who are doing okay? Okay. Sorry. This is inevitable. Okay, next one. Some of these we've talked about a little bit. Ask factual questions near the beginning, spend lots of time in interpretive questions, and try to wrap up or move towards evaluative questions. And know that with adults, you're fighting that. Right? They want to go straight to questions of values and implications, and they don't want to spend time interpreting, usually. And so you've got to work really hard and have a plan for how you're going to like find those snag points and spend some time interpreting. Too many factual questions will feel like a quiz, and it's probably a sign that you're teaching the text, right? Okay. Factual questions can recenter the group, so they do have their place, right? If your group gets off <coughs> in the weeds, Bringing it back to the text is a really good thing, you know. So that's they're they're your friend in those particular circumstances. Adults, we said this. Adults jump to evaluative, and your job as a facilitator is to slow that down. And we've also said this: over prepare, right? 90 minutes, you may have 15 questions. Um, if you ask all of them, that means nobody was talking, and <laughs> that probably was not a very good conversation. So, you know, uh, good conversations, you may only ask a few because, like the group really takes off. Or you may spend a lot of time asking follow-up questions, right? You're kind of connecting things. Um, these are some potential techniques for opening and closing questions that I've just seen work really well. So one thing I like to do is obviously you get everybody in a circle um, and um, you want to get everybody hearing their voice in the room right away, right? You, so you want everybody to say something at the start of the conversation because they get used to hearing their voice in the room. So one thing you might do, I've also, we've all been part of conversations where it was 90 minutes and we spent 30 minutes on introductions. And that, to me, that is not a particularly productive way to get towards a meaningful conversation. It also creates a lot of opportunities to create hierarchies because people give you their whole credentials, they give you their entire life experience, why they have authority on this topic. The one good thing about it is you'll find out who your big talkers are. But other than that, you kind of want to avoid it. So I kind of like to, Let's say um, I might say that the theme of a text that I'm teaching is democracy. I'm just going to use an example, right? Like I'd ask everybody to start. So I pick a, an opening question that's rooted in a theme that I'm going to want to talk about. And I might ask people like, all right, I want everybody before we get started to just take out a piece of paper and a pen. Three words that come to mind when you think of the word democracy. Three words. Give everybody a minute. All right. And then, all right, I want everybody to go around the room, and I want you to introduce yourself, your name, or whatever you'd like to be called in this conversation, and one of the words from your list. One word, right? So you get everybody goes around, you surface some of the ways the group is already maybe thinking about that theme. You can probably return back to that, but it's a quick way to introduce everybody that's also kind of thematically connected to what you're about to do. And it doesn't create hierarchies in the room. Potential closing question. Um, I've seen this, so we talked about this idea that good conversations leave you wanting more. So when you're coming to a close, you might, that might be the one time you want to do a forced answer, yes or no question, right? And at the very end of a conversation, depending on what the text was and what the conversation was, you might ask a question and just say, everyone, everybody go around the room and just answer yes or no. So I, I feel like the answer to this question is no right now, but like I'll just use this as a dummy example. Like, um, what did I write down? I had actually a question here, right? Oh, this is based on the Jane Addams piece, right? Do you trust, she talks about the idea of trusting democracy. Do you trust our democracy? And just ask everybody to go around and say yes or no. So if you do that and you force everybody to say yes or no, what do they all want to do? What do they? they want to explain. Oh my God, they want to explain. They're like, oh God, you're like, I, I can't just say yes or no without explaining it. Is that what you were going to say too, Cliff? Oh, you think so? Oh, with that question, maybe. Or, or depending on where you are, they all will say no, yeah. right? But you're right. They might, all right. I didn't think about that. But yeah. But I think what often happens is people kind of want to explain, and they've got that feeling on the tip of their tongue, and that's a great place to leave conversation. What will likely happen is, like, class dismissed or whatever, and everybody gets up and they start talking to each other. Or they want to go home and they want to talk about it. And that, that's a great thing. Another classic closing question that I like to use is, like, who's someone that you want to tell about tonight's conversation? Right? So getting there, and that gets people thinking beyond the room, right? Like, who am I going to go home and keep talking and thinking about this with? And you don't have to give an explanation. Just say grandma, right? My wife, my kid, right? My, my friend Larry, whatever it is, right? So those are examples of closing questions. 
Um, worst questions. We've talked about these a lot, so sorry for hitting these over and over again. What did you all think? Did you like it? Hopefully I've convinced you that those are not particularly compelling questions. We haven't talked about this one yet. This is a grave sin. Somebody said, you know, I was really struck by yada, 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 right? Have we been, has anyone been in a conversation where somebody kind of does a version of that? You know, what I saw or what I was really struck by, what's wrong with a question that starts that way? It's really leading in, in when you give your interpretation first, like some people will not want to go against that. Just be respectful. Yes. Anything else that you guys would add? It's telling everybody what's important, right? And you've answered the question and there's nothing left to say. What you're actually asking people to do is to agree with you. I was really struck by this. Did you all see that? Am I not the smartest person in the history of the world that read this text correctly? So please, please, please catch yourself if you're doing that. Yes, no questions with the exception of I think that there are times when like getting everybody quickly to kind of jump to a point kind of gets the group out. And I think they're kind of fun as closing questions because it makes people want to keep talking. But in general, yes, no questions. Like, what? OK, yes. And then we've all been in that. We're, like, it's like if you've ever been with a teenager, well, elaborate. Tell me more about your day. I want to know more, right? Like, yes, no. If you give them the option, they will just say yes or no, and then you'll be done. Um, and again, that kind of we can all agree. That's that doubting consensus. Well, we can all agree that you know democracy is a good thing. Like, again, doubt consensus and try to avoid questions where you really like phrase in that way. Like, we can kind of all agree with that. Spend time. Find out what the group really thinks. And maybe they don't all agree. OK. Um, just briefly, I heard that you guys set some norms up here. Do you guys, anyone want to tell me guys what you had up here? Um, language is a really big thing. Um, so we avoid racial ethnic gender, sexuality, offensive language, because uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion on dehumanization and uh, oppression and like war. Like we were talking about what people called the enemy in a certain war. Right. Did you guys come up with these as a group? Yes. These are great. Any other things up here that you were really proud of? Number five. Speak Let up. Everybody know that their voice matters in yeah. conversation. Yeah. That's kind of a ground rule. Yeah. So I love that you guys both spent time to set norms and you also posted them. And that's actually what the next slide is going to say. <laughs> set and post norms for discussion. So, and they're exactly all around these themes. What is an o isn't okay to say, right? Um, and I think language and being really mindful, especially with historical texts, especially with dehumanizing language about the enemy, those are really important, right? I would also ask you to think, like, how do you want people to contribute? Do people need to raise their hand? Do they need to be acknowledged? Like, you know, I just think, like, kind of letting people know what's the right thing. And you can kind of feel your way through it. You can try it the first time. And then if you don't think you need it the next time, you can change it. Um, and I think that kind of white, what kind of mindsets do you want people to like go into this with? And this next slide is really about kind of some examples. I saw these at a facilitation, a conversation that I observed in Oregon, and I just thought these were some of the best like norms, especially around those mindset questions. So like speaking your truth, lean into discomfort, right? It's okay if we are a little uncomfortable with this or we don't agree. And lean into each other, right? We're here to help each other and support each other. Like, we collectively will make this conversation meaningful and successful. Commit to non-closure. I love that one. I love that one. I love that one. Embrace paradox, right? Sometimes there's just going to be conflicting things that we can't resolve. Um, and then this one is a good one for me personally. I'll just use, like, seek intentional learning, not perfection, right? It's OK if we're didn't, there's no right or wrong answers. But I like that we're here to learn, not to be perfect. OK, so I just want to share those as some examples. Um, sorry, I'm doing something I really hate to do, which is like lecture for a long time. But we're getting kind of so here. I just thought I'd share a little bit about my experience with veterans groups. I am by far not an expert here. And so I would love people, if you've got questions or other things you want to contribute, to please share. Um, so I will just say, and I'm going to share a story here in a minute. But OK, we'll go to the next slide. So kind of things to keep in mind, in my experience, these are kind of some of the opportunities I think are special about working with veterans groups that like no other kind of adult discussion that I've ever been part of happen with veterans. So one is like this kind of esprit de corps, right? This is kind of veterans are like really good at this and, they, and they've, they've, 
I don't know if this is something they build in, in the military for you, if you go in with this, but this is like something that veterans groups really have. And um, so that ability to like work together, sorry, ooh, so graceful, to establish kind of shared goals around participation and helping each other succeed. I've just never seen anything like, well, the way veterans will help each other succeed, right? Especially when something is difficult, right? And that is something that is unique in my experience to working with veterans. So that's that next. Um, and this is related to this. Veterans have a lot of leadership skills, right? Their experiences in the military means that they've probably had some types of leadership, you know, a lot of leadership experience. And then you can really tap into that as a facilitator, especially to address challenges in the group. So I'm gonna give an example. When I was doing the veterans programming in New York, one of the texts that they read, this was a group in uh, Syracuse, the, they read a text that had an, it was like an ancient text. It was probably some ancient Greek, ancient Roman text, right? And there was kind of a line in there about like camp followers or sex workers and kind of, you know, and um, particularly like a trans sex worker, right? That like there were boys dressed as girls and these were sex workers. And that was very triggering for a veteran in one of the veterans in the group. And it turned out that he'd had this experience like in Asia and he was, and had never talked about it before, right? And so this text really brought out a lot that nobody was kind of expecting or, I mean, anticipating. Um, and so the facilitator had to do some work kind of in the moment, but especially afterwards, because this was a group that was going to meet again. I mean, he said a lot of language, right? A lot of kind of anti-trans, anti-Asian language. Like there's a lot that kind of came out really quickly. So, but what happened was that there were other veterans in the group, like someone who actually offered like, hey, I'd be happy to call and talk to that guy like out between sessions, right? And also to kind of say, I mean, this, this, this was a Vietnam veteran who had this, and then the, it was an Afghan veteran um, who kind of said, I don't know anyone who served in Asia who hasn't had this experience, right? And just kind of, and again, that, that kind of helped diffuse and create space for talking about this, and then the kind of ways that the veterans were kind of working together to like address that challenge and bring that guy back into the group, right? but also to kind of reset and establish some of those norms. So I just use it as an example. It's like the kind of leadership qualities that are present in veterans group are a real opportunity, especially when things maybe get uncomfortable or really, really difficult. Um, and I saw it happen. Um, and it's, it's a really remarkable thing. Um, so I will also say this, like going to war and returning home from war are universal human experiences, all societies in all places and all times. That means we have this incredible body of literature in the humanities, right? And I have been in so many conversations with veterans who will say, I never knew how to put into words like the experience that I had, but I read it here. And there's something I, I've just observed and heard <coughs> veterans say that's kind of comforting about reading something that's like, okay, I'm not the first person who's ever had to go through this experience. And I think that that is the kind of the full beauty of what the humanities can do is to bring in all of that kind of that universal human experience. Um, some of the challenges that I think um, texts and conversations can surface like really difficult experience that veterans may have not discussed before, right? And I guess that's true kind of in any conversation, but I think it's particularly perhaps true when you're asking people to talk about or bring to the table kind of their experiences either going to war, in combat, in service, or returning home. Um, and I will just say that kind of means that you need to be prepared, I will say, and be ready to kind of remind and enforce norms. And you may want to think about how to help the other veterans in the group help you do that. Um, we talked about this already. Um, I think I think it's always important, it sounds like you're going to wrap up today with this. These kinds of conversations can be therapeutic, but they are not therapy. And I think we all have to have a lot of humility about what we're accomplishing in these kinds of conversations and both acknowledge that they have therapeutic value, but it is not therapy. None of you are, I don't think like licensed therapists, right? And so having some humility about that um, is just really important. And when you're talking about this, I just, more it's more about the people who go and fundraise for this kind of programs. They're like, we're gonna fix veterans with our therapy conversations. Like, shut, shut up, no, like that's not what's happening. Okay, next slide is just, um, you probably know this, but avoid falling into kind of the societal, we all know what the societal tropes are. Veterans are heroes or veterans are damaged. So just like work really, really hard to kind of avoid either of those. You're gonna piss people off and really set yourself up for failure. And really thinking about your own position as a facilitator, whether or not you are or not a veteran. And just like 
Don't pretend to know something that you don't know or to have experience with something that you don't have experience with, right? That's okay, because um, people will smell right through that really quickly, right? So anything else that folks want to add or throw out around, like, as you think about working with veterans specifically? Maybe this has already even come up. I don't know. I'm sorry to rush right through this. I told you I overpacked this slide deck. All right, rookie mistakes, lessons learned. Just some last to hear thoughts. Don't introduce yourself with an extensive bio and definitely don't ask participants to do so. Waste time, I think, and it sets up hierarchies and it just forestalls certain kinds of connections and conversation. Short text work, that's more a lesson for my friends in the academy. Like, short text can be just as good as a long text for having a productive conversation. Start with some sort of short quote or passage. So even if you read a whole novel, like, come in and like, let's read three paragraphs out loud together, right? Like, kind of ground everybody in the moment in the text with the thing you actually want to start talking about. Moments or silence are not a sign that something is wrong. It is often a sign that people are thinking, they're gathering their courage, or what may be wrong is that you asked a bad question. So like, <laughs> you know, it's not something wrong with them. It may be something wrong with you. So just like, like, let it happen and be comfortable with it. Get out of the way of conversation. I struggle with this. I, and I'm like a real, I'm an affirmer. I'm always like, oh yeah. Oh my gosh, that's a really good point. Yeah, I love that. Da, 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 da. Now, if you do that too much, A, people will wait for it. And if you don't say it, somebody's gonna be hurt. They're gonna be like, oh, I must have said something stupid. Um, and also you're just kind of constantly insert. And like, I struggle with this. Like, I, this is me. I'm like a cheerleader for everybody in a conversation. And I kind of have to remind myself, just, just chill. <laughs> know when it's time to move on, right? Like kind of, we've, not everybody has to say everything about every point, right? It's okay to kind of move along. Um, and even if it feels a little artificial, like, okay guys, I think we're gonna move on to something else. Bad questions lead to bad discussions. So that's just spend time really thinking about questions. Never do popcorn reading or reading aloud from participants. I really think people have a lot of anxiety about reading out loud where they haven't had time to prepare. And so if you're waiting for your turn, all you're doing is thinking about what practicing, you're not listening to what's being said, and if you're listening to what's being said, all you're paying attention is how fluent that reader was. You are not paying attention to what's being said. You are the only person in the room who had time to practice. So if it needs to be read out loud, you should be the one to do it, okay? Direct negative energy towards and through the text, not towards participants, right? Like, okay, like, and, and just think a lot about how do you get people to kind of like direct that energy to the text um, or the author or the character and not towards the participants. Seat big talkers directly next to you, i.e. out of your eye line, right? So if you're sitting here and you're talking too much, I, I don't really see her, right? Like I can kind of look around. And that, when you make eye contact, you give people permission to talk. Mm -hmm. Now you can't do everything. Some people are gonna talk, right? But this is like a little trick that you can do once you've figured out who your big talkers are. And Big talkers probably want to express their leadership qualities. So you can have a side conversation with them and kind of say, Jennifer, I've noticed that Cliff doesn't talk a lot about. So like in our next conversation, could you kind of help me try to get Cliff a little more engaged in the conversation? No, I'm well, all right. So I, again, it doesn't always work, right? But like that's a technique that you might try if you run into that particular challenge. If you've got a group that's really quiet, some easy, obvious things, you probably know these things, turn and talk. All right, turn and talk to your neighbor and talk about this question before everybody comes out to the whole group. Um, take a moment to jot down a couple of thoughts before coming out to the group, right? These are just things that give people time to kind of gather their thoughts or out of the big group um, and those, and then go back and ask the same question for the whole group. Facilitation is a performance. It may not always be exactly what you think. You may have ideas about the text that you don't express, right? Your job there is to get other people to talk. So facilitation is a performance. 